the chapters having things that could be done as intermediate uh, solutions, but then at the end, the final chapter is about um, how more long-term solutions can be approached. And uh, again, it deals with, with that from both the micro and the macro perspective. The importance of, of socialization, the importance of dealing with macro institutions, and um, how, you know, if you don't deal with both of those, then you might as well not deal with either one, because they're both extremely important to be dealt with at the same time. So, so that's kind of, that's kind of where, where I'm at, okay? Um, Thank you. Oh, and thanks for inviting me here, Anthony, and for putting this together. Very nice. My name is Walter Enlo, and I'm a teacher here in Hamlin. I've been a teacher here for 17 years. Um, to, I guess one way of talking about this would be to, uh, to paraphrase the, the, uh, the philosopher Hannah Arendt, uh, her idea that um, many people may be able to tell stories of what you have produced or what you have done, but only you can tell the story of who you are. Um, and so I, I, I go back, I'll go back to, uh, I grew up in uh, my first nine years in central Louisiana. Uh, my father was uh, worked for the Veterans Administration. Um, I grew up around the state mental hospitals for adults and for children. Uh, and I was very familiar with being in place and out of place. Uh, my grandfather was a circuit riding minister for the Presbyterian Church. He'd been sent from the north, northern United States, to northern Mississippi, where he had seven rural churches. Um, and he preached four on one Sunday and three on the other for about 50 years. Uh, and also was aligned uh, with the work of Miles Horton and the Highlander Folk School. Um, from the age of nine, my parents knew they wanted to be um, to work for the Presbyterian Church and become missionaries. So we moved to Atlanta in uh, in 19 when I was nine years old for my father and mother to go to seminary. Uh, and I grew up with the World Book Encyclopedia. I, I memorized that those 24 volumes because I knew we were going somewhere. And by the time I was 11, we had the choices of going to the Belgian Congo, going to Korea going to Brazil or going to Japan. At age 12, my family moved to Japan and I grew up in the city of Hiroshima. Uh, and so that is sort of, uh, sort of my background. And so I spent my first five years there. My parents were in Japan for 30 years. Uh, my parents built, uh, with the help of many people, built the first rehabilitation center for handicapped adults. I became a model in Japan. Uh, it was the first time that Japanese people were taken outside of their homes and put in and were allowed to live in dormitories, married housing, and became productive with, uh, a, a, which still works today, with a, a, basically a series of companies, uh, printing companies and handloom country, a number of things that help people be productive in, in community. Um, I came back and went to college in Florida and immediately began working in Upward Bound. I was the token white boy uh, who worked in Upper Bound and in, the, in, the, in June 1968 was arrested for the first time in a demonstration. Uh, this was in St. Petersburg, Florida where um, there was a garbage strike following uh, the garbage strike in Memphis uh, where Dr. King was assassinated and so 38 of my Upper Bound students one, one uh, Monday did not show up and they had all been arrested. Uh, these garbage workers had were the only, the, the, the drivers got a, a five cent raise, the, the, the pickers were all African Americans, got no raise at all, and that started this. And so my students, who were two or three years younger than me, were, if you will, my upper bound students, were the ones who actually uh, challenged my notion of what it meant to be um, committed to, to human justice and social equity. Um, and so I became very engaged in working with upper bound and uh, and then I went on to, to, to Emory University in graduate school in the Institute of Liberal Arts. And when I was there, got there, I discovered there were a group of uh, students who had received the National Endowment for the Humanities Grant to make a film series, a nine program series about changes in public schools in Atlanta. And they saw this big old football player, me, and said, well, who around here is gonna be able to carry the 35 millimeter camera to do the filming? So I was chosen, I went to a local PBS station and learned how to film, and was the film, uh, the, the person who did the camera for, for these nine programs. 
uh, these schools that we went into, uh, that we, we filmed segregation academies. They were known as Christian academies, but they were true segregation academies. We filmed the first Montessori school in the South that had all of its teachers who had studied in Italy. We, we, uh, we filmed uh, a, f a free school, which was built out of, uh, in a series of huts, um, geodesic domes on the Chattahoochee River. Uh, we filmed a Black Panther school where we were literally stripped down with, with guns on us and made to strip down into our underwear in order to decide that we were not carrying weapons or any kind of devices, uh, recording devices. Um, and we filmed a little school called the Paideia School in Atlanta, which I fell in love with. And I immediately began working there as an aide that next spring, and then began working there all the way. I began as a kindergarten teacher, as an aide, and worked my way up through teaching kindergarten and high school. And then in 1980, I was asked if I would come back to Hiroshima, but this time to be the head of the international school. And I went and was a teaching principal. I taught K1 and 2 in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade and was the principal of the school for, for eight years and was able to get it accredited and raise the money to create the international school piece. Uh, and so that was what brought me to Minnesota. There was a professor at the University of Minnesota, John Kogan, a professor of comparative developmental education who asked if I would come and become the senior fellow in global education at the University of Minnesota. And I did that for a number of years, also worked with Harry Boyd in the Center for Democracy and Citizenship, and became known and, uh, basically as a school, a school reform person, which is what I do. Uh, most of my work is, though other people will label me a peacemaker in the sense that I started a, a club for children called the Thousand Crane Club that was adopted by UNESCO and spread all over the world, this idea of folding paper cranes and for, for peace and the story of Sadako. I'm most um, enthusiastic, because that belongs to children, as far as I'm concerned. I'm most enthusiastic about the work I do in schools, uh, both here at Hamlin and developing the learning communities on the master's level and the doctoral level, but also my flagship school, uh, the, the Avalon School here in St. Paul. Avalon is a school uh, that um, is a, uh, a professional practice school, that is the teachers own the school and run the school, they are the boss of themselves, and the school is run uh, with a, um, basically, this is a, a school based on project learning. In order to graduate as a senior, you have to do a 350-hour project with a public presentation. You think that might help you be ready for college? I think so. But the most important thing about the school is what the students also have, like uh, in relationships with the teachers. There is a school constitution. And if you ask most people to describe the four branches of, of, the, of government in the United States, most of us can describe three. We will describe the judicial branch, the executive branch, and the legislative branch. But seldom you hear people talk about we the people. At Avalon they talk about we the people of Avalon. And this constitution, which took two terms to develop by the students, is a constitution in which the students are the legislature, they make all the rules in the school. Uh, the uh, executive branch are the teachers, and they can veto any rules made by students. And then there are restorative justice circles and peer mediation circles where the adults and teachers can come together to mediate, negotiate, and solve the issues they have between them. So, uh, in terms of my own work, um, I think of myself as a teacher who also writes. I'm not a writer who teaches. I came to uh, higher ed reluctantly after teaching 20 years in K-12, and, uh, and I came because I thought I uh, could make a difference. Uh, so many of my um, colleagues in, at the Paideia School in Atlanta, half of them had graduated from Harvard, uh, they all were negative about their, their teacher education experience. Every single one of them were negative. And I realized it was because most of them had professors of education who could write books and they could talk about stuff, but they couldn't do it with kids. So particularly in pedagogy, it's one thing to write a book about how to teach reading, it's another thing to have helped 300 kids learn to read and write a book about how to teach reading. So I really, I decided, well, I'm gonna go get 15 years of teaching experience then, so I'll be credible. And so I went and got 20. And I now, this is my 40th year as a teacher, and I, have, I spend every week in schools, uh, which is sort of my commitment to, I, I, one other thing about that is I have a very strong uh, 
position, a political position with the people I work with. In American education today, we are 